Chapter 4 The Best Years When a person invents something, for example, a battery powered back scratcher for miniature poodles, the inventor sends a description of the invention to a patent office. An examiner looks at the idea and decides if it's really something new or just something that is a little bit different from an already invented gadget. If it's really a new idea, the inventor gets a patent, which means other people are not allowed to copy it. It takes a very smart person to understand inventions when they're just at the idea stage. Albert was that person. Reading applications for new inventions was like solving puzzles. Albert was so good at his job that each day he completed his work long before it was time to go home. He then was able to turn his attention to his first love. Thinking. Imagine what this must have been like for Albert. It would be like a kid going to school every morning, finishing all the schoolwork within an hour, and then playing for the rest of the day. With all that time to think, Albert ended up writing and publishing more scientific papers. In one year alone, he published five groundbreaking papers in a very famous German journal about physics. A storm broke loose in my mind, explained Albert. So, in some ways, his patent office job turned out to be a lot better than the teaching job that he had originally hoped for. With steady work at the patent office, Albert felt that he could ask Maliva to marry him. So he did. She said yes, and they were married in 1903. The following year, their son, Hans Albert, was born. Now Albert had the time to enjoy music, long dinners, and long walks with his family. Albert was happy and secure. Confident in his job, he could relax, be more himself. For Albert, that meant dressing carelessly, wearing the same wrinkled shirt day after day, and often forgetting to brush his hair. As someone once said, Einstein looked as if he'd just smoked an exploding cigar. Albert's years at the patent office were wonderful. He had a family, time to think and write lots of scientific papers, and enough money. Many of the greatest scientific achievements of the 20th century electronics, the atomic bomb, space travel, were all suggested by Einstein in the papers he published while he worked at the patent office. Those ideas were then worked on further by other scientists in the decades that followed. Then, in 1909, the University of Zurich convinced Albert to leave the patent office and become a professor. Albert would actually be paid to teach and study physics. Life was even more wonderful. In a short time, Albert became a very popular professor. College students enjoyed the way he explained difficult concepts with simple images. Think about this image. A man falling freely in the Earth's gravitational field who drops an object will not notice it is falling. And Albert loved to lecture. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. Albert was invited to speak all over Europe. He was a rising star. Albert accepted other teaching jobs that took him not only to Zurich, but to other European cities like Bern, Prague, and Munich. Albert's theories were startling. For example, Albert claimed that light bent as it traveled through space. This surprised scientists, who assumed that light always traveled in a straight line. Who was right? Often, a scientific theory can't be proven. But this theory could be. During a total solar eclipse, the moon blocks the sun's bright light from viewers on Earth. This makes it possible to photograph the light of the stars beyond the sun. Albert insisted that a study of those photos would show light bending as it passed other planets and the sun. All Albert needed to do was wait about four years for the next total eclipse, in 1914. Many scientists were also excited to see whether Albert's light theory was correct. In 1911, 
plans were begun to send a group of scientists to Russia to test Albert's theory. Russia was one of the best locations from which to photograph the stars during the eclipse. Of course, 1914 was still far in the future. In the meantime, Albert continued to think, give lectures, and develop his eccentric genius style. Hopelessly absent-minded, he often forgot his apartment key, even on his wedding night, lost luggage, forgot to eat, and used money as a bookmark, then lost the book. He always buttoned just the top button of his coats. Why? It's simpler that way, he said. When Albert shaved, he used only water, which is a very painful way to shave. So a friend gave him shaving cream. Albert tried it, said it was marvelous, and then went back to using water. Why was that? It's simpler that way, he replied. Questioned about his odd look, he explained, it would be a sad situation if the wrapper were better than the meat wrapped inside it. What was really amazing was how Albert was becoming popular with people who had no interest in science. With his wild hair, mismatched socks, wrinkled shirts, and pants that were too short, Albert was not just a brilliant physics professor. He was a personality. His mysterious smile beamed from the front pages of newspapers around the world, a genius who had unlocked the secrets of God's own mind. People who didn't understand a bit of his physics, who didn't know an isobar from an ice cream bar, were fascinated by Albert Einstein. Articles about Albert showed up in many magazines and newspapers. Had TV already been invented, Albert would have been the subject of all kinds of hour-long specials. Einstein in 4D People measure objects in three ways, length, width, and depth. Anything, a piece of toast, a TV, a yo-yo, is so many inches high, so many inches wide, and so many inches thick. These three ways of measuring are known as dimensions. Albert threw in a fourth dimension, time. Albert said that the dimension of time was as important as length, width, and depth, especially when measuring something really big like outer space. To think about the size of outer space, but not the time it takes for something to travel through that space, is like thinking about a song without the lyrics. Something important is missing. Einstein's Theory of Relativity In 1905, Albert published a paper about relativity. It said that everything, except light, travels at different speeds depending upon different situations. Think about relativity this way. If you look up at the sky and see a plane in the distance, it doesn't appear as if it is going very fast. You stand there and watch as the plane seems to move slowly across the sky. Yet, if you were standing next to it, the plane would zoom past you in a split second. Blam! Boom! Gone! And yet again, if you're sitting inside the plane, it barely seems to move at all. See how the speed of that one plane can look totally different to you in different situations? That was Albert's point. The speed of a moving object depends on how it's being viewed. An Einstein Thought Before Einstein, scientists thought that the sun was always in the same place, with the Earth and other planets orbiting around it. Think of the sun and planets as being like your neighborhood. Your home is always on the same street. Your school stays in one spot. You don't have to go looking for these places every morning. Albert, however, shocked everybody by claiming that the sun, the other stars, the planets, everything all of the time, are moving through space. Think of a parade with bands and floats always staying the same distance from each other. But the whole parade is moving down the street. 
famous formula. Warning: hard stuff. E equals m c squared is a scientific formula. It is so short that it looks simple, not much harder than two plus two equals four. That's part of the reason this formula is so brilliant. Albert figured out that a very difficult concept could be explained in a very brief way. Make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. E stands for energy, and M is for mass. Mass is the amount of matter in something. Mass is a little bit like weight. The third thing, C, is for the speed of light. Light travels really, really fast. Ever try to outrun it? Basically, what the formula says is that when a little bit of mass is changed into energy, a whole lot of energy will be released. That's what happens with an atomic bomb. An atom is split, mass changes to energy, and an incredible amount of destructive energy is released. With this formula, Einstein claimed that all matter. From a feather to a rock, contains energy. Chapter Five: Albert hits high gear. If A equals success, then the formula is A equals x plus y plus z. X is work, y is play, z is keeping your mouth shut. Albert Einstein. In 1913, a famous university offered to pay Albert more money than he had ever made before, and all he had to do was come to the school and think. He would teach only when he felt like it. It was a dream come true, almost. The one drawback was that the university was in Berlin, Germany. Although it had been nearly 20 years since Albert last lived in Germany, he hadn't forgotten his awful high school years. And Albert's wife Maliva didn't like Berlin or the people there. She thought they were mean and unfriendly. Maliva was also jealous of Albert's success. She was a brilliant scientist, but the world only cared about Albert. The more she thought about it, the less she wanted to leave Zurich and their many friends. Albert had to make a decision: Would he go off to Berlin to think? Or stay in Zurich and be a good husband and father. Albert needed brilliant people around him who could help him think about his ideas. At the time, a scientist said only a dozen men in the world understand relativity, and eight of them live in Berlin. Albert remembered his hikes through Italy and the promises he had made to himself. He decided to go to Berlin. Albert left Maliva and their two children behind in Switzerland. Albert once admitted, "I treat my wife as an employee whom one cannot fire." It was not surprising that Maliva and Albert soon got divorced. Thereafter, Albert had little to do with her or their two sons. Years later, when Albert won the Nobel Prize in 1922, he sent the prize money to Maliva and their sons. Perhaps this made him feel less guilty for having abandoned his family. Albert's oldest son, Hans Albert, grew up to become a distinguished science professor in California. Occasionally, he visited with his father, Edward, born in 1910. The younger son, whom Albert nicknamed Teddle, which means little bear, was gifted in music and literature, but suffered from mental illness. After his mother's death, Edward lived in a hospital for the rest of his life. Albert once congratulated his son Hans Albert, whose birthday he never remembered, for being just like himself when it came to family. It is a joy for me to have a son who has inherited the main trait of my personality, the ability to rise above mere existence by sacrificing oneself through the years for an impersonal goal. This is the best. Indeed, the only way in which we can make ourselves independent from personal fate and from other human beings. Albert never questioned his decision to choose scientific discovery over family. 
As for moving to Berlin, Maliva had good reason for not wanting to live in Germany. In the early 1900s, the countries of Europe were struggling with each other for power. Some countries had a lot of land, but little money. Many people were not allowed to worship as they wished. Several countries had large populations, but weak armies. They all wanted what the others had, and they were willing to fight for it. The tension grew and grew. There was so much hatred, Europe felt like it was going to burst. Germany was one of the scariest countries. The government wanted to build the most powerful army in Europe to get rid of all of Germany's enemies. When Albert arrived in 1914, Berlin was full of German soldiers that were trained, armed, and eager for war. It was a very uncomfortable place for the peace-loving Albert to live. But one person in Berlin, Albert's cousin Elsa, made life much more pleasant. Elsa was full of affection for Albert. They started to spend a lot of time together. Elsa was soon in love with Albert, the man, not the scientist. As far as Albert was concerned, he and Elsa were a much happier match than Albert and the challenging Maliva. Soon the couple announced that they were going to get married. Elsa took care of Albert, which was good because Albert certainly didn't. He was ever more careless about getting enough sleep and eating properly. Albert's doctor said of him, As his mind knows no limits, so his body follows no set rules. He sleeps until he is wakened. He stays awake until he is told to go to bed. He will go hungry until he is given something to eat. And then he eats until he is stopped. Elsa looked after him, making sure Albert got up on time, got dressed, and ate his breakfast. Life with his second wife suited Albert very well. However, it is an interesting fact that Albert's very best scientific thinking was done during his marriage to Maliva. Perhaps that doesn't mean anything. Or perhaps, as some critics say, his great theories might really be their great theories? Or even her great theories? Some publications, even Time magazine, which proclaimed Albert Einstein person of the century in its December 31, 1999 issue, wondered exactly what Maliva may have contributed to her husband's scientific ideas. In 1914, Europe finally burst. The weak political agreements that had kept countries out of war collapsed. World War I erupted, with Germany's great armies facing France, Russia, and England, and quickly winning many battles. Wars run on hate, drain countries of food and money, and cause the deaths of many. Albert hated the war. He hated all wars. This war also brought a particular frustration to Albert. He had hoped to prove his theory of curving light through photos of the 1914 eclipse. Just as German scientists were setting up cameras in Russia, war broke out. Germany and Russia were now enemies. The Russians arrested the German scientists and destroyed their equipment. The eclipse passed with no photos. It would be another five years before Albert would have a chance to photograph another total eclipse. The combined forces of Russia, France, and England eventually slowed and stopped the German victories. The war became a stalemate. Year after year, neither side could gain clear victory over the other. The supplies needed to fight the long war drained Germany of its money, food, and fuel. And meanwhile, thousands of German soldiers died each day. German leaders kept insisting that the war would end in their favor. They ordered the country's best scientists to say that, yes indeed, Germany was doing a great job fighting the war. Albert refused to make such a statement. He said, Never do anything against conscience, even if the state demands it. And he meant it. The German government was furious with Albert. It wanted to put Albert and his ridiculous head of hair into jail. But Albert was lucky. He was still a citizen of Switzerland. It was difficult for the Germans to imprison somebody from another country. 
especially a peaceful one like Switzerland. Germany finally lost the war in 1918. Albert had managed to stay out of jail. More than ever, Albert was committed to promoting peace. In the following year, 1919, there was going to be a full eclipse, the first since the one in 1914 that didn't get photographed. It was step up or shut up time for Albert and his theory of bending light. Many scientists in Germany hoped that Albert would be proven wrong. Then perhaps all his other theories would be ignored too. Before the eclipse, cameras were set up in two locations one in South America and one on an island off the coast of West Africa. There were two cameras in case clouds suddenly moved in and blocked the eclipse in one place. That way, there was still a chance to get photos at the other location. The cameras were pointed at the sun. Ordinarily, the intense sunlight made it impossible to see or photograph the movement of light as it passed the sun and planets. But then the moon moved in between the sun and earth. It blocked the sun's brightness, and suddenly light not seen before could be photographed. The cameras clicked. Once the photographs were developed, Albert was sure they would show that light bent as it passed the Sun and other planets. On November 7, 1919, the news was announced. Albert was right. Light did bend. Although very few people understood what Albert Einstein was talking about, the whole world recognized that he was a genius. Suddenly, Albert was a superstar. A tobacco company even introduced a new product, the Einstein cigar. And within a year of the eclipse, over 100 books and articles about Albert were published. Now, 80 years later, the number of books and articles about Albert is in the thousands. All the fuss may sound wonderful, but to Albert, it meant losing his treasured privacy. The attention, Albert wrote to a friend, was so bad that I can hardly breathe, let alone get down to any sensible work. He was the first genius superstar. Albert made the best of the uncomfortable situation. Because of his growing fame, he could have become rich by appearing on radio shows, making speeches, and writing books. A London theater offered Albert as much money as he wanted. If Albert would appear on stage with fire eaters and tightrope walkers, Albert's act would be explaining his theories. But Albert said no. Instead of making money, he wanted to use his influence to make the world a better place. For Albert, that meant a world without war.